and we're on to uh, the final speaker of ARDD, um, one of the great leaders in our field. I'm very happy to um, invite Vera Gorbanova to the stage. Let's give a warm welcome. Well, thank you very much, Morton. Uh, well, it's a special honor to be the last speaker. <laughs> I'm really proud, although I hope it doesn't mean that, like, if you move someone down the program, that next time I'm not invited because I'll be out. <laughs> okay, I, I really enjoyed this meeting so much. Uh, okay, let me begin. Uh, so I will continue the topic of comparative biology of aging that was... Uh, so brilliantly introduced by Emma, my disclosures. Um, so we study bats too. I will say a few words about bats. Uh, we also study other mammals and, uh, well, there was a question mentioning bowhead whales. So yeah, this is the most amazing, that's the longest lived mammal. It lives over 200 years. Uh, and then there is a naked mole rat, which is a rodent, but it lives more than 40 years, same size as a mouse. Um, so the goal is to find adaptations that evolved in those exceptionally long-lived animals and then find, once we understand the mechanism, we can then apply them and develop pharmaceuticals. And I will show you some of the ways. So this is the slide I've showed many, many times. So I will just say very briefly that one of the approaches, okay, take these long-lived species, uh, find uh, this gene, then put it into mouse models, because of course we don't want to do longitudinal studies in bowhead whales that live 200 years, would take too long. But we can take those genes that we find from these animals and then put them in mice and see if it extends mouse lifespan. And if it does, then we can uh, develop small molecules that could recreate the same milieu, and then it can go into human patients. Okay, so Emma gave this brilliant introduction to bats, I don't really need to say anything, you are all convinced now uh, that bats are amazing. Uh, so we were very especially interested in this immunity and because immunity is so linked to inflammation um, and bats know how to deal with it, they know how to be resistant to viruses or tolerate them and then they, that probably helps them live long. Uh, so some time ago, we wrote this review, actually it was beginning of the pandemic and we were all fixated on bats and coronaviruses. Um, and we came with this idea that um, there are many uh, genes related to immunity that already suggest possible drug targets within bats. Uh, so here, for example, oh, sorry. Uh, so here you can see um, these, there are some already very well-known drugs like aspirin that target the same pathways that are altered in bats. And there are also some new ones um, like this family of pyhin genes that, are com that is completely absent in bats. And in many species, it's just gone, gone. So wouldn't this be a nice un target for anti-inflammatory interventions and eventually for anti-aging interventions? Okay, so now let me show you some data. So this is the work of uh, Fatima Attar, um, a very skilled and talented postdoc in the lab. Uh, so what Fatima did, she took primary fibroblasts from four bat species, and we were interested in two questions. So what are the mechanisms of cancer resistance uh, and also longevity? Because, well, these creatures, to live so long, you must not develop cancer too early, obviously. Uh, and a special attention to this one, but... Uh, it lives, in our set, it was one of the longest lived, little brown bat, more than 30 years. So we uh, checked the telomeres at first, and very consistent with what Emma said, yeah, they don't shorten. Uh, and in the cells and tissues, we found a lot of telomerase expression, um, which also is consistent with this uh, model we proposed some years ago that... Um, Repression of telomerase activity and replicative senescence as a consequence of that evolves in species 
uh, that are bigger than about five kilos or 10 kilos. And bats are smaller than that, so we didn't expect it to find that. So they, they keep their telomeres on, and that probably helps various regenerative properties. But at the same time, it would predispose them to cancer, right? So how do they manage? So what Fatima did next, uh, she decided to count how many hits are required to malignantly transform bat cells. And in humans, it's five, so these are classical studies of Bob Weinberg. In the mouse, just two is enough. Mice, boom, and they get cancer easily. Uh, and we expected that bats will show us, you know, at least they should be better than mice by a lot, but, you know, that's not what we found. Just two to three oncogenic hits was sufficient, uh, which, of course, made us thinking, okay, how they do that. Um, and last year, I presented the story about whales, so I will not talk much about whale, but I kind of showed this idea um, that it was considered called Petos paradox. So very large species like elephants, whales were hypothesized to have more tumor suppressors than short-lived and small ones. And indeed it was confirmed that in the elephant there are multiple copies of P53 pseudogenes. Um, in the whale it wasn't. Um, so, it, when Fatima tested these bad cells for a reduction of programmed cell death, which is what P53 gene triggers, there was really high level of apoptosis. And then, indeed, we found that at least uh, in the small, in the little brown bat, we found multiple copies of P53. So, here they're a little bit like elephants, but not all of them, so uh, it doesn't yet answer that question. Uh, but, yeah, they use this strategy. Uh, and then the question was, okay, um, you know, maybe they kill their cells more often, uh, but what about, uh, you know, still, how they not get cancer? Uh, and here, this is the work of another postdoc, Anatoly Karatkov. Um, so he developed this assay to measure double strand break repair in the bat. And to our surprise, we found that here we just focus on little brown bud because that was the longest lived in our group. So here is the efficiency of repair of double strand DNA breaks comparing mouse to bud. You see, it's like, it's more than 10 times higher. So they're just so good at maintaining their DNA. So maybe that's why uh, they don't have these super sophisticated layers of tumor suppressors. They just fix their DNA. Uh, and then what Anatoly did, he also looked at fidelity of repair, uh, like how well they join these ends of DNA, and here, mouse, you see there are lots of mistakes. Uh, but in the bot, the, the repair, repair was much more precise. Uh, another interesting feature, DNA damage uh, often leads to inflammation. And that's true for uh, mice, and I, we just recently published a review in Nature Reviews Immunology, how DNA damage it not just messes up our genome, but it actually induces inflammation. But not in the bat. <laughs> so somehow, either they just repair the damage so well, they don't need to worry about it, or also the immune system is tuned differently, because these sensors of DNA damage, or like DNA fragments in the cytoplasm, are actually um, down-regulated. They have the sting, so this is the sensor for DNA in the cytoplasm. They have inactivating mutations or like down-regulating mutations. So now we generated mice with the same mutations. We'll see how they do. Because then again, well, sting inhibitors are being developed for various immune conditions, but that may also help for aging. Uh, so it kind of resembles the story of the whale uh, which, you know, but it's different. So in the whale, we also didn't find, you know, many more tumor suppressors, but we found extremely efficient and accurate end joining. And then we went into the mechanism, and I'm just skipping through that because I presented most of this work last year, so you can watch that talk. But we found two genes from DNA repair pathway, um, cold induced RNA binding protein and RP2 that were expressed in the whale in much higher levels, especially KIRP like almost 100 times higher on the protein level. 
Uh, and this is a protein that induced by cold exposure. And when we put this protein into human cells, it improved DNA repair efficiency by about threefold. So we can actually, and, and it's very similar to uh, whale and human proteins are quite conserved. Uh, so we could just upregulate our own by going into sauna, like what some of us did yesterday, and jumping into the water. So you actually upregulate this whale abundant protein, and this may help with genome maintenance. Uh, so now I want, um, you know, very briefly to talk about um, our approach where we don't take individual species, but we actually take multiple species of mammals and we find what are the common pathways that are conserved in the longer lived ones, those that correlate with a longer lifespan. This is the work of Jinglong Lu, very talented bioinformatician. Uh, so he compared the transcriptome of um, you know, about 30 species uh, and found genes that either positively or negatively correlate with maximum lifespan and develop these signatures. Um, and then we could use these signatures to also evaluate uh, different interventions done in mice. So we could see whether the transcriptome changed towards the longer lived ones, like think about whale, you know, if, did your treatment made the mouse more like a whale, or it just did something that just only helps the mouse, but it doesn't move in the same direction as evolution. Interestingly, rapamycin changed everything in the right direction, but for, for example, color restriction, it was sort of a mixed bag because it upregulated uh, genes, the negative lifespan genes, but also uh, upregulate positive lifespan genes. So this may be, this signature may be a way to evaluate interventions. Is it something that's only, you know, works for mice? Well, maybe it will work for humans, maybe not. Or is it really, are we moving in the direction that evolution of lifespan moves? Uh, so now I want to highlight, well, that's been published, so I will not go to a lot of detail. You can read the paper. But what I want to highlight that when in these uh, negative and positive lifespan genes, so in the positive ones, this cluster that came up with completely unbiased approach was again DNA repair. So we keep coming to the same theme uh, of DNA repair. So to live long, you need to maintain your genomes. Uh, so that was the cover, so that's how we see the fountain of youth. So it's like more diversity, right? Just humans, you know, let's put everybody in this picture. <laughs> um, and, uh, okay, so, but how, how do we maintain the genome? Right, so this is the paper that just been accepted in EMBO, uh, and uh, I will just, you know, briefly mention that here we were looking for ways that humans uh, achieve, you know, maybe um, but the genome stability, and this is in collaboration with Yusin Su and Nir Barzila, and he alluded to this work, um, that we had a variant that Yusin identified in Nir's cohort um, of CIRT6. So this is sort of a, one of the CIRT2 in the longevity genes, and uh, it had uh, two missing mutations, and we characterized it, uh, and we found that this is... Um, centenarian variant of CERT6 actually is better at DNA repair and also it better at silencing transposable elements that we heard about these genomic parasites uh, and it changed enzymatic activity in kind of unexpected way. It reduced the acetylation HDAC activity of CERT6 but enhanced its mono-ADP ribosylation activity. Uh, and here we tried, okay, if we just give a boost of CERT6 so this is work in collaboration with Steve Horvath uh, and Ken Raj. So Ken Raj provided us with fibroblasts uh, from older people. We expressed CERT6 just for two weeks and then measured the methylation age. Uh, and it went down. In like nine cases out of ten, it went down. And what changed was uh, DNA conformation. So this is from RNA sequencing, uh, chromatin assembly. Uh, so again, it, it was enough, we just uh, shape up the transcriptome, uh, the epigenome a bit, and we uh, saw this rejuvenation signal. Uh, so many people have been looking for activators of CERT6, right? And it can, uh, it extend lifespan in transgenic mice, so this is the work of Chaim Coyne. Uh, and now we see that just giving a boost of it can also achieve the same result. But we focused on activators of ribosylation activity, because that's what we observed in the uh, centenarian variant. And uh, we tested some molecules that were reported to affect CERT6 HDAC activity, and one of them, Fucoidin, 
uh, was activating ribosylation. So this is a molecule you heard about in one of the first days. Um, comes from seaweed. Uh, it's a very strong activator of um, CERT6. Uh, mono ADP ribosylation activity, it has these different uh, structures. Uh, and uh, we started giving it to old mice. Uh, and here is the frailty index. So mice on Focoid and have lower frailty score, which is very exciting. Um, and because it's a very safe molecule, it's already known as a dietary supplement. People take it for various causes. So, of course, we don't have a proof that it works through CERT6, but again, it's so safe. Everybody can take it, and maybe it will improve your genome stability. Uh, so now we are... Uh, you know, gearing up, we are, we'll be soon recruiting for this clinical trial of Fucoidin uh, in cancer patients. And um, just the uh, last couple of slides, so we, I, sh I showed you this transcriptome study, but on the same 30 species, we were also now doing metabolomics. Uh, so we're looking like in an untargeted way. This is the work of uh, Greg Tombline, um, very, uh, you know, excellent um, expert in proteomics and metabolomics approaches, so he's running MASPEC uh, all the time. Uh, and here are just some things that come up by looking at metabolomes. So uh, carnosine um, was in a much higher level, so this is plasma metabolome, in the naked morat much higher than in the mouse. Also, we found very high levels in the bowhead whale. Uh, and what is carnosine? It's also one of those supplements that people take. It's, uh, you know, supposed to help against, you know, various things. It's, it's a peptide, dipeptide. It is being promoted as antioxidant, anti-inflammatory molecule. And all of a sudden, we find, we find high levels in the naked molar at the bowhead whale. And this is just the molecule we know. What about those we don't know? And maybe new ones. So here is another uh, TMAO. Uh, so this is... Also, it's found in marine mammals. It stabilizes proteins under pressure. So, you know, not so surprisingly, we find very high levels in bowhead whale, but also in the naked morad. So these are just, uh, you know, some examples of findings from metabolome analysis. And, you know, to conclude, well, here is the hallmarks of aging. This picture was shown so many times. Many things go wrong with age. Uh, but what's the causality? What's the underlying cause? And... Uh, I'm going to propose that, you know, if we try to really find the cause, this may be in DNA damage because we come up with this theme again and again, even in unbiased way, and also disruption of this epigenetic structure. Uh, so when we are young, everything is neatly organized within the nucleus, but with age, it gets unraveled. Like you see these, the sock drawer, when you fold everything after you've done your laundry, it's all very organized, but you go in and out and pull the socks and, you know, push them back, and it becomes like that with aging. So we have to now find strategies to organize it, which could be done, well, there were brilliant talks about reprogramming, one way to go, or maybe with CERT6, or other factors that can do it. Uh, and finally, okay, how do we target these underlying causes of aging? Uh, and these are the lessons from these very long-lived species. Uh, we can enhance DNA repair, enhance epigenome maintenance by better maintaining heterochromatin, silencing transposable elements, and now we can adjust our transcriptome or metabolomic networks. And now I, I showed you just, you know, we're just starting to organize all of this metabolomics data, but there may be many molecules that, you know, we can already use. All right, so I was naming people as I was going along. This is our group. We are having very nice retreats also. Uh, and uh, uh, we are looking for post postdocs. So you come and join us if you want to work with male whales and naked morads and bats and all these ex exotic species. We have uh, wonderful collaborators. Um, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Vera. That was a great uh, final talk. Uh, I like that we end with DNA repair. This is good. <laughs> um, Vera, beautiful presentation to close. And uh, because you have been involved in this field for so long, um, how do you see the future? Do you think that in 10, 20 years, we should be able to control aging and maybe reverse aging? Thank you. 
well, I, I see the future, you know, is very bright <laughs> because, like, I was so impressed by, you know, how this meeting and this community has grown and we, uh, you know, I, I'm really quite old. <laughs> I remember when it was still very kind of exotic field, but now uh, we have all the biotech coming in and uh, there are also so many targets. So I'm showing these hallmarks of aging once again because you can help aging by actually addressing any of these and it will help and people showed all the you know amazing studies how you can target various hallmarks but we are also getting closer to targeting the underlying cause so I think well you know 10 years maybe 20 years and uh, we will be able to actually achieve very significant uh, lifespan extension if not reversal so yeah I, the future is bright. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. So I was wondering, like coming back to bats f for a little bit, I was wondering if like s some of the species of bats are like hibernating and some of them don't. Like for example, the myotis bats, uh, bats, not bats, do, and the molosses, for example, don't. So do you think it could be like a promising direction to uh, take the genes linked to hibernation and like slower metabolism? as a consequence, and express them into the non-hibernating uh, species? Well, you know, this is a very good idea. Uh, you know, if we start from, like, really primitive organisms like C. elegans, so the genes involved in dower formation, well, they actually, well, here you get insulin IGF signaling. So there is definitely this link, uh, and now there is even a, a biotech company found a bio that studies hibernating rodents. Uh, so there is a lot to learn from there. Of course, we don't want, you know, we all want to extend, uh, improve health span, but we don't want to put ourselves in hibernation. So we have to be careful about it because we all still want to be uh, active and running around. But there are certainly some components of that uh, that we can borrow. People also study bears and like how come they don't get blood clots when they hibernate. So it's a very promising direction of research. Very interesting. I, I have a question about the SIRT6 um, variant, the centenarian mm -hmm. variant. DNA confirmation changes was the top hit. Uh, I think, as I, I can't remember. It's, did you look into secondary DNA structures like G quadruplex or other types of structures in, in cells expressing this? Well, so cells that express the uh, centenarian variant of SIRT6 are better at DNA repair, mm -hmm. and uh, we looked at, you know, and joining homologous mm -hmm. recombination. Uh, we didn't try to give them a particular difficult structure to resolve, mm -hmm. uh, but it may be doing it, because SIRT6 has these two activities, right. just coming to DNA breaks and maintaining heterochromatin. Mm -hmm. So maybe what you are referring to this DNA confirmation may, maybe could, could be involved in its heterochromatin function, but we don't know. Well, we uh, were talking to Will Bohr for a very long time to collaborate, they could do some in vitro assay with CERT6, so I hope we'll still do it at some point to answer your question. <laughs> Sounds very exciting. All right, I think with that we will close ARDD. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, listening. <laughs> thank you so much. That's really nice, really kind of you all. I mean, this has been uh, a journey, you know, a lot of work, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Um, and we'll be back next year. Um, we need to thank a lot of people. We need to thank our sponsors. You know, without our sponsors, can we get the slide on? Um, without our sponsors, you know, none of this would be possible. Sponsors. We are so, many sponsors are in this room. Yeah, and, and, and we many are. Many companies are have sponsors. So. Without sponsors, nothing would be possible here because yes. 
we flew in the speakers, yeah. right? So the sponsors have been absolutely critical, and we've been extremely blessed with with a great number of sponsors that have, have been supporting our conference, so we're extremely grateful for that. We need to uh, we need to thank also the speakers and panelists. We had more than a hundred speakers and panelists in this these last five days. And uh, we need to thank um, the audience. Thank you so much for sticking around and listening to the amazing talks and also the audience uh, at home. Um, we also need to thank the, um, the rest of the organizers. Thank Alex, thank my partner in crime, Daniela Bakula, who is uh, not here, but Daniela. Um, we need to thank uh, all of the other people that have helped. So there's been an army of volunteers um, outside and uh, in the background, fixing hotels and updating websites and programs and all the graphics stuff and everything that's been fantastic. So we also need to give them a round of applause. Um, thanks to the AV guys. They are, they are also starting to become regulars here at ARDD. And uh, thanks to the university also for hosting us. And thanks to Alex for starting this conference. Without you, you know, none of this would take place. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't know if, have we run out of people to thank? Or? Well, you need to thank yourself. Because if you are in longevity, you're already doing something useful. Yeah, and so next year will be uh, even bigger, even better. We'll have 500 speakers, I heard, and uh, it will continue for a month. And now we, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Uh, but there will be an ARDD next year, and we um, we really look so much forward to seeing you all next year again. Thank you so much. So before you go, before we close, I need to thank Morton. Because without him, nothing would be possible here, right? So one of the most charismatic faces of longevity by technology that I know of, MD, PhD. And he worked so hard, 52 weeks every week. So next week we have a call about the next one, right? Obviously. And, there, and, and, and he and Daniela will be running it. Mm. So if you can give a round of applause to Morton and also to Daniela, please. All right. Th thank you so much, Alex. And um, the bar. Yeah. Let's go to the bar. <laughs> thank you. And take some pictures before you leave. This is the most beautiful location in Copenhagen. Sorry. <laughs>